Hi, it's Vish. Thanks for listening to Creative Control. If you'd like to support the show financially by making a monthly flexible donation to keep this podcast going, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Emma Donahue is a multi-award winning and Oscar nominated writer and author based in London, Ontario. Originally from Dublin, Ireland, Donahue has written several novels, short story collections, and children's tales. She adapted her 2010 book Room into a screenplay for an Academy Award winning film of the same name, which earned the actor Brie Larson many Best Actress Awards, including an Oscar in 2016. Donahue's latest novel is Akin, which tells the contemporary story of a 79-year-old man named Noah, a widow about to leave New York City for a trip to France to try and make sense of his late mother's mysterious whereabouts during World War II, but is suddenly charged with caring for his 11-year-old smartphone-addicted great-nephew, Michael, after his father is killed and his mother is incarcerated. The whimsical and thrilling Akin was published by Little Brown, Harper Collins and Picador in September of 2019, and ahead of making reading appearances at events like the Eden Mills Writers Festival, Emma and I sat on a bench outside of her local library in London to have a pleasant chat about this novel akin, her trajectory as a writer, meditations on what has become of photography over generations, the success of Room, what's next for her, and more. A part of the E1 Podcast Network with the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash creative control plus in-kind support from CFRU 93.3 FM, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 495th episode of Creative Control featuring the very talented Emma Donahue with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Emma. How's it going? It's nice to be with you. Where where are we exactly? We are outside the Fred Landon Library in London. It's my local library, and it's got a great sculpture of gigantic pencils. Oh, so yes. one of my favorite spots, actually. I see them. So how often do you frequent the Fred Landon Library? Once a week or so. I often come and work here um, or across the road in the Black Walnut Cafe. I mean, this is really my beat. Right. Okay. So you've lived in... You're from Ireland originally, Yeah, right? from Dublin. And right. then I spent eight years in England doing a PhD. And then instead of going back to Ireland, as most of my friends were, I fell in love with a Canadian, so I ended up in London, Ontario. And that was 20 years ago now. Wow, that's kind of odd that you ended up in a city named after, you know, London. It often strikes me as a tragic irony. You know, there are, <laughs> there are quiet days of the year when I think, why am not I in the big London? <laughs> but I have to say I'm very happy here. So <laughs> sometimes so, you just have to accept where your destiny has led you. So how long have you been in this particular neighborhood? Almost 20 years, I think. 20 years. Yeah. So this is home. Yeah, and you know, this this area, Wortley Village, has been voted best neighborhood in Canada a number of times. It's very friendly. And um, the only embarrassing thing is that lots of people know me, so they'll be like, oh, I saw you podcasting outside the library. <laughs> oh, you mean in the area? <laughs> yeah, in the town. You're exactly. going to get some guff in the next few days. Is that the deal? Okay. Well, yeah. no, it's it's lovely. This does seem lovely. I've never, I don't, I've been to London many times. I don't believe I've ever been to this area. It seems. It seems expensive. It seems like it's, you know, you have to have some money to be here. Is that fair to say? Um, it is expensive, but it's not at all the fanciest part of town. It isn't? Okay. No, people move out of here to get fancy houses <laughs> in Old North. This is this is where, yeah, you have money to buy the house, but you also want it to be kind of, you know, shabby and relaxed. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, per, that's, that's me in, in a nutshell. I'm shabby. <laughs> I'm vaguely relaxed. 
Anyway, it's nice to speak with you. We're, we're ostensibly here to speak about your latest uh, novel, Akin, which I enjoyed very much. Congratulations on this. Uh, how are you feeling about it? People are, are is it out now? I, I know I have an advanced copy. Is it out? I think it comes out in a, maybe a week. Um, so I'm still fresh. I'm still happy to talk about okay. it. Okay. So I'm not all, you know, weary of it as I will be in a couple of months. So you, you so go off your books when you're promoting them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> your mind is always on the next book. And so it can be quite hard to keep talking about this one. I've but heard, no, this one, I'm fresh. I've heard about that. I, I've heard of that. I hear that from authors often. Like you kind of let it go as soon as you, you hand it in. But it's worse for musicians. I mean, the Rolling Stones having to constantly do their the oldies. Same thing, so <laughs> it must feel like they're trapped in their own youths. <laughs> it also, I think, might stifle your writing impulses if you're constantly just playing the same thing over and over again. You have the luxury of writing a book and then moving on to the next one. You're not really expected to... Res- well, I guess you do readings and stuff like that. But only for a limited time. Right, I mean, you know, right. the most you would do is read a bit from the book a year later for the paperback. That's about as long as it could hang around your neck like an albatross. And that appeals to you? It does. It, it does. does. Okay. Yeah. All right. So can you, for people who haven't quite read it yet can you do me the the uh, favor and summarize uh, the story of a kin sure a kin is a kind of an odd couple traveling around the south of france it's uh, about a 79 year old man called noah who's a former chemistry professor mm-hmm. widowed retired and he's heading off to france from new york to work out what his mother was up to in the war he's come across some old snapshots which are sort of puzzling to him and at the last minute he is saddled with an 11 year old great nephew he's never met before who's you know borderline obnoxious and he has to bring this child with him so it's a kind of a travel story and it's all about trying to figure out the previous generation and and all the questions that you can't ask them anymore because they're dead so there's there's a lot in it about death and mortality and war but you know cunningly hidden inside quite seductive material about pastries and seaside <laughs> views and you know the setting's very touristy right so but the, the, the content is quite dark the boy is named michael and what are the circumstances uh as much i we, this is always a, a slippery slope for me because i don't want to spoil any any anyone who wants to read the book i encourage them to read it so we'll be careful here but what are the circumstances that bring michael and noah together exactly do you mind sure explain? um michael his father is dead and his mother is in jail um, I was I was basically I had invented this character and I, I wanted to give him um, some reason why he would suddenly be handed to a great uncle he's never met. So I decided to make him one of the many kids who are effectively punished by their mothers being incarcerated. So so he's an 11 year old, but he's quite toughened and worldly and has quite a shell yeah. because he's had, you know, a hard upbringing in one of the, the, the most the last ungentrified bit of Brooklyn right um, so he's very you know impoverished and on the defensive and you know the last thing he wants is to have to travel around France with this snooty old great uncle of mm-hmm. his who keeps giving little professorial lectures on things <laughs> and the boy Michael is very this story is very much a 2019 story it seems to be really not mired in the technology but the boy is a, a screen zombie and Noah is a 79-year-old who doesn't really know much about that world. So you really have this odd couple, right? I really had fun with the with the different generations. So not just that they're different ages, but also each generation uh, in time has its own particular kind of habits. So the boys' generation are very digital. Um, but also, I, I think one big difference is that, you know, Noah's generation kept things to themselves more. They weren't, you know, they were not vlogging. They were not podcasting even. They were not Instagramming um, everything they exactly. did. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they wouldn't have been taking selfies, for instance. You know, the right. boy carries a camera around. Um, Noah's own grandfather is a famous photographer, but the boy only takes, you know, deliberately blurred selfies. So their aesthetic is different. Everything about them is different. And I really enjoyed setting these two uh, very different male members of the same family. Um, in, in interaction. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the two characters' relationships with, uh, with their own parents and, and maybe what you're getting at in terms of parenthood and how much we can really know about what our parents are really like because we have this illusion growing up with them that they're a certain way. Of course, they have past that we don't know about. So I do want to get to that. But do you have a sense of where this story might have come from exactly you mentioned conjuring michael but what, what do you suppose inspired this i i think it was provoked by um a landscape for the first time ever in my career i'm not usually very sensitive to place you know i usually hmm. just write books out of 
you know, a powerful interest in something, but not because I'm there. But in this case, um, we spent two years in Nice, in mm -hmm. France, mm -hmm. and um, really, as soon as as soon as I was settled in that city, I got fascinated by its combination of, you know, delightful, sensuous, even sometimes quite, you know. Uh, shallow tourism right. and then you know the little memorial plaques about the World War II on every corner you know I'd be literally eating my pastry and I'd glance up and I'd see a little sign saying a young man had been hanged there by the Nazis right it's quite morbid the tourism on some level yeah it's but it's historical. also it's yeah. quite sort of honourable it's like you know yeah. do not forget you know the, the little plaques often address you quite firmly like passerby do not forget right. you know be grateful um, so I was intrigued by that and also I came across the story of Matisse's daughter. Matisse, the painter, was, mm -hmm. was based in Nice for a long time and his daughter was this meek studio assistant of his, you know, she just helpful to daddy. And then in her 40s, she suddenly got pulled into politics during the war. And I, I loved the idea that this very domestic woman would, would suddenly find a whole new sen side of herself emerging because of the war. And I, and I suppose I'm intrigued by these issues of, you know, like at what point do you take action? Right. You know, right. and when they come for your neighbors, you know, do you stay behind the curtain? Right. You know? right. Who are these people who find it in themselves um, to actually get involved politically? Well, the context of these stories, I mean, the, the one from the past, I suppose, like Noah's reckoning with the past on some level michael is dispassionately dealing with his present which is his mother's in jail his father's been killed um and the circumstances don't seem to really register with michael so there's a whole backstory there that i find fascinating itself in terms of finding the tension there with the villainy i suppose you've chosen nazis that's easy we can <laughs> write about the nazis are you suggesting there's a parallel between modern police. Well, like the rise of fascism yeah, today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not one-to-one. -one. It's not like, you know, the cop on the beat in Brooklyn is exactly the same. But there are all sorts of little moments that echo each other. Yes. You know, so, so when Noah's pontificating to the boy about, you know, what it must have been like in, in wartime Nice with the, you know, evil police chasing you down, um, you know, Michael's like... Yeah, yeah, that's know? what it's like in Brooklyn. Yeah, a and, bit. and in yeah. particular, my black friends feel that, yeah, you know, yeah. so he's he's aware he's one of these kids who may be only 11, but because of the Internet, they have a, you know, at least a, a nodding acquaintance with many things. I mean, that's an unnerving thing about parenting today. You know, you'll be discussing something like, you know, Jeffrey Epstein and suddenly your your 11 year old is going, oh, yeah, I heard about him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I have two kids and I yeah. we were riding in a, in a shuttle van recently and the guy had the news on and I wanted to ask him to turn it off. My kids are eight and four. Um, oh, even more so at that age. Yeah, yes, you're yeah. like, cover their ears, cover their ears. Because <laughs> they absorb everything. Like well, like, after we left Nice, two weeks later, that guy in the truck drove oh, down the right. promenade slaughtering people. And I didn't want our kids to know, so I didn't mention it to them. And then at the airport in Ireland, they they literally saw footage of the promenade. They were like, oh, there's the promenade. You know, so I had to tell them the whole story. So there's no protecting kids nowadays. All you can do is attempt to explain in a way that Instagram doesn't. Well, the promenade that you're talking about, referring to, is featured in your novel, and Michael thinks it's a joke on some level. Uh, there's this... Yeah, he looks up footage of, of the aftermath of that terrorist attack on Bastille Day in 2016, and, and, you know, it looks like a video game to him. Exactly, yeah, that's an odd... Anyway, there's lots of little moments like this. I want to get back to what I was getting at a, a few moments ago about our parents, knowing our parents... Um, what is your do you do you have this relationship with your parents where you like you wonder what they were like or you're surprised by what they well, were like? I just last year lost my mother to Alzheimer's. So, oh, I'm you know, we to, literally, I'm very sorry to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. We literally, you know, saw her memories and her words go. Um, but my mother left me her whole stash of diaries. And these were really kind of minimalist diaries in that it's kind of her daily agenda. You know, the day might just say, have a haircut. But then it also might show her crossing out that and saying, it rained, couldn't go. You know, <laughs> baby had measles. You know, she had eight of us. So in kind eight? of... Eight? You were exactly, one of eight? Yeah, wow. Yeah, rampant Holy Catholicism. Cow. Okay. So, so in, in sort of telegraphic <laughs> style, they contain a lot of her days and she kept the diaries for 60 years. Right. So when she got the dementia, she said to me, you can have the diaries and feel free to use them, you know. So I have this fascinating sort of personal project of reading through them like day by day right. and and getting little glimpses of my mother and of course I can't ask her you know what each bit means or what she thought of that film she saw in 1952 sure. so so yeah the rich memories in some ways but always very partial and also their generation is just different to ours and ours is different to our kids so even if you ask the questions they don't necessarily answer them in in your terms I mean my dad is still alive but 
I'm not going to start interrogating him about, you know, any darker moments in his life. It should you know, be. We would, we would feel rude. We should highlight that your your parents are and were Irish as well. Yes, indeed. So you've got the Catholicism, you've got the <laughs> Irish. There's a lot of standoffishness there, right? We're a very gabby nation, but it's not necessarily personal revelation. You don't emote. Yes. On some level, I've heard that. Is that yeah. true? Like, is that is that a truism? Well, we certainly, we, we joke about things. And with your friends, you you would show your fondness by slagging them, you know, by mocking yes. them. Savage mockery. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, we can have quite frank discussions about, say, politics and religion and so on in a way that my impression of England is that that would rather shock them. Okay. And when I first came to Canada, I found the politeness intolerable, actually, because it seemed to me that at least at first, for your first maybe 10 times seeing someone, they would only speak of the most bland and safe subjects. <laughs> so now, of course, I found actual real friends in Canada. I can talk about anything with them, but uh -huh. you need to seek them out. You know, in those initial conversations, it's all very nice weather we're having. <laughs> but on the other hand, Canadian politeness is great because, you know, I remember um, having a, my first haircut in Canada and the hairdresser said something about, you know, your husband. And I said, no, no, she, my partner is a woman. Right. And she apologized. Oh, and I thought, wow, nice, polite nation. This is way nice. better than, you know, rampant homophobia. <laughs> I've heard of intolerable cruelty. I've never heard anyone describe <laughs> intolerable politeness. That's hilarious. Well, you know, this could, it might just be a, a result of, of Canadian multiculturalism. It might be oh. that you need to develop certain kind of verbal etiquette around people's that's differences. True. I've certainly found that about queer stuff. Yes, know? that's true. That's a good point. Okay. So... The, the the aspects of our parents' lives that are unknowable intrigues you. It sounds like you had a personal connection there. Um, how much do we want to talk about what Noah discovers about his mother uh, through the stash of photographs and, and images? I don't want to say too much, but, yeah. but what I would say is that what I was interested in was moral ambiguity. I mean, yeah, the book is not saying Nazis are bad. That's obvious. What the book is saying is how do we weigh the subtleties of how our parents' generation may have reacted in hard times yes. or in, in scary times? Yes. You know, how do we begin to judge them? Right. How do we figure it out when so much was left unsaid or swept under the under the carpet? And also, how do we judge it? And, you know, who are we to judge it as well if we didn't live through the same experiences? Um, you know, just as we're often baffled by our kids and, you know, how they begin to deal with what they hear of on, in the media. Um, similarly, it's, it's very hard to even judge our parents' generation. And uh, France, you know, it could have been any country that I set this in. I just happened to have this connection with France because we, we um, lived there for two years. Yeah. And also my partner's mother was a child in France in the war. And oh, she okay. always talked about, you know, the kind of ambiguities of her relatives that some of them would have been very clearly on the resistance side and the others not so much mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. so so france tip is typically stereotyped as like the, the good victim country in terms of the war like nice france who lost so quickly when the nazis marched in but actually there's you know, some ambiguity oh, there. there's a lot of ambiguities right. there okay yeah okay as i'm sure there are in many countries so the but the country's own myth about how it spent the war um, is 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 a fairly false one. So France would just be an example of how morally murky we all are, I suppose. I mean, we'll all have to account for the fact that we didn't do much in, in the days when climate change became crystal yes. clear, for instance. Yes, it's true. Um, so it's this kind of ambiguity I'm interested in. And so I would say Noah discovers likely scenarios, and he's, he's trying to deduce a lot from these snapshots. And of course, a photograph... Even pre-digital, it, it can show you what, what the photographer was looking at that particular day, but you still don't know quite what it meant. So I found photography a really interesting art to work with in this story, that it can, uh, you know, it, it can be clear what building you're looking at, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the story of why the photographer was interested in that building is clear. I wanted to ask about the photography as kind of a... It's a it's, photography is almost a motif in your book, and I also wonder if any of this is a meditation on the evolution of technology and the import of technology. We used to really value photographs uh, as an, uh, you know, you take for me as a kid, I grew up with the 35 millimeter film and you, you, you took, and you, we had so few, you, you had we? 24, you had 36, whatever you had, and you had to be really careful and you, or you tried to be anyway, maybe we didn't even, maybe we weren't even that careful, but you took your 24 shots, they get developed, you get them and you'd be like, ah, oh, this was okay. This isn't so good. Oh, this one I'm going to frame. You've got Michael, who's just got a... Uh, he doesn't even Compulsively have a selfie. Compu yeah. All of us do. We have these phones. I'm, I don't know where mine is at the moment, but we have these phones that let us do whatever we want for our, you know, and, and to the detriment maybe of the art form to the point where there's just so many of them that they've lost... I, I, sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Are you saying something about the meaning 
like of Noah's generation and his parents. His father uh, was a photographer of some renown. You've got a kid who just doesn't take it seriously. Are you th talking about information and technology on some level? I am, and I suppose, you know, even though my inspiration had been Matisse's daughter, and so painting was his form, but I thought photography would be a much more interesting one to write about because it raises these issues of, of tech and, and because the changes from one generation to the next have been so startling. And also, photography pre-digital had such an amazing um, power as, as actual testimony, you know, proof evidence, of something. Evidence, actual evidence. Actual evidence. Yeah. So it's a bit of a fallen art form now in that everything's, you know, fakeable. And um, of course, you know, audio is too. You know, we've all seen that, that footage that was deliberately made showing Obama saying outrageous things. You and know, you Nancy can, Pelosi. You can put words in people's mouths. Yeah, I'm going to manipulate this to <laughs> all the hell. You're not I can only do. imagine how I'll sound. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah, that's the other aspect of it. Uh, the manipulation and not m the mistrust of our current modes of uh, information. I feel like that's all sort of there. And yet, you know, the, the power of people to say, you know, film the policeman on your phone when he's beating up your friend. Yes. This is thrilling. You know, all these, you know, this, this whole rash of, of white racists exposed on Twitter, right. you know, ranting away and caught on somebody's cell phone. It causes me such pleasure, <laughs> you know, because they think they're safe. But effectively, it's, there's, it's like there's a camera crew potentially everywhere catching so, you in what used to be your private life. Yes, exactly. Um, so, surveillance um, states. Yeah, so, yeah, surveillance is pretty sinister when Google's doing it. But I have to say, if, if, if somebody's doing it when the police is, are beating up their friend, then it seems a thrilling use of the technology. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's true. And there's a real questioning of authority and akin, obviously. I mean, we've hinted at this already, but this notion of you know who you can trust, whether it's your parents' authorial voice or the actual authorities, um, that seems to be there seems to be a connection between those two things as well. And Ken, would you say? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you know, I, I I try and never write about writers. You know, I hate novels that are really just a meditation on how cool it is to write a book. But I have to say, in this case, what Noah is up to is very similar to my process whenever I'm writing a historical novel because I gather the facts really industriously. I really try and be a detective and be very scrupulous with myself about you know what time was the train on a Sunday. Um, but then, of course, there are huge gaps, and I have to just make it all up. Right. You know, which is, it's an odd mixture. Um, because, you know, when I'm doing the creating, I do feel that my, you know, researcher self is saying, this is not on, <laughs> you know, but it's such fun to do both. And, you know, when we're trying to work out, say, the truth of a family story, you know, you gather the facts as best you can. Absolutely. And then the rest, you're just speculating. Are you, are you maybe suggesting, I don't know if you're suggesting this, has this exercise, has this book and the process of making it wish made you wish you'd asked your mother more questions do you think that there's a lesson here for people like i as people who listen to the show know i had a my mom is okay but we had a rough year she had cancer and and it was it was rough and um it made me have all this instant regret about what i didn't and didn't know about my parents so I feel like inherently there's some messaging there about that in this book. It could be. And about 10 years ago, I did um, a video. I, I interviewed and videoed my dad and my mom and my, my partner's parents and so on. I did it as a kind of a, a family history ex exercise. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. And that's and what I planned to also do Also, you still. might think you'll remember if you just chat to them in conversation and you won't. It's like it's like writing down cute things your kids say. You, If you don't write them down, you will forget them. There are things from my childhood that I have told millions of people. <laughs> and then I, I've recently w would cross-reference them with my mom she's like no that's not what i said i'm like what oh that's been the basis of all these jokes and anecdotes for for years and so. those of us who work in the arts there's a real danger if we use our material for say fiction yeah we remember that more vividly because we've had to work on it over and over right. so i know i've got false memories of my children's <laughs> upbringing that are actually from out of one of my novels so what i do is after i publish each novel i go through it with a, a highlighter and i mark the bits that i know are, mm. are really borrowed from one of my kids and i write their name in the margin oh that's you know partly so that they will feel like oh cool we inspired that book you know in detail but also partly so i'll remember which bits are them and which bits are made up right because it messes with your own memory. Right, absolutely. And I assume you have an interesting, uh, 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 I, w I, w I don't want to say interesting, that's a blasé word, but I assume you have a profound relationship with m memory given what your mother went through. Yes, I do. I, I, and, and vocabulary even. You know, whenever I use a fancy word, I think, oh, OK, 
okay, I'm, I'm glad I still have that in my treasure bag. <laughs> Though funnily enough, when my mum got dementia, she needed her fancy words because sometimes you forget the basic word. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't remember meal, you'll say, uh, shall we have a collation? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the more words you have, the longer the words last. You, right, know? Right. you have to keep using those words. <laughs> <laughs> you described your process of a moment ago and, and how you are kind of deductive as a researcher and as a, as a novelist, which... I, and you mentioned some, we've talked about your upbringing, uh, one of eight children. It sort of all brings me to how you got into this, um, how you found the spark to become a writer. Do you have a recollection of when you, when, when writing spoke to you? Yeah, I was seven and I was just walking home from school and I, 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 I just felt, you know, this burning need to write a poem about a fairy. A burning need. A burning need. It was like a mystical experience. I don't feel I really saw a fairy or anything, but it, but the words started forming in my mind, and huh. and and it felt absolutely thrilling that these particular words had never occurred to anyone. Not that they were good words, right? <laughs> it's just the the process of inspiration that felt so thrilling. <laughs> Not that the results were, um, and I was like rushing home to write down these words, and and you know it felt as if I was being contacted almost by the words so yeah i would say i would say writing was 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 the single most thrilling thing in my childhood you at know? seven years old you at you seven. have this calling someone something tells you to come up with this poem were you read to a lot as a child yeah i was read to a lot and my my dad wrote books about literature so literature was very valuable your father was house. a writer is a yeah, writer. yeah yeah literary critic he's done twice as many books as me yeah so literature was revered and i read a lot yes okay so that's the that that's the that's the hummus out of which all this grew i suppose and i still read a huge amount so did you at seven write down that poem I think I did. I know I collected all my work from the age of nine, so I've never suffered from <laughs> modesty <laughs> or underconfidence. It's funny, uh, a couple of years ago, I gave all my archives to um, Western. Um, oh, because, the university yeah, here because in London. Yeah, my partner yeah. teaches here, and you know, they've paid our dentistry over the years, so I feel kind of grateful oh, for right, that. Oh, right, right, the know. benefits? Irish yeah. teeth needed a yeah. lot of work, obviously. <laughs> so the relief I felt when I sent off those 20 big boxes to what they call the ARC. They have this climate-controlled place where if you want the papers, they, you tell a sort of robot forklift to go and get them. So no human being goes right. and looks among the boxes, you know? Right. Anyway, I felt such relief getting rid of all this stuff, including my poetry from the age of nine. And yet, I clearly wanted it to still exist. I wanted it to be safe somewhere like a memory. Right, You know, right. but I don't want to read it. This is not you feeling like a highfalutin person. You just, <laughs> I mean, they asked, they probably asked you, we want your stuff. Yeah, I didn't have to beg or no, anything. No, no, okay, all right. Well, you're. But as they said to me, um, you know, in case, in case I was, getting my ego swollen you know they said to me we only actually catalog it on an as needed basis oh <laughs> you know? okay so it'll it'll sit in there in the climate controlled <laughs> arc and um, nothing will be done to it unless <laughs> some student says i want to research her <laughs> it all sounds like a scene from raiders of the lost ark <laughs> maybe that's why they call it the ark i have no idea so i just want to touch upon this though you have this spark as a seven-year-old here we are many, many decades later. Yeah, I'm how turning you, 50 uh, this year. Oh, congratulations. That's Thank great. you. Yeah, that's amazing. So how do you go, how does that develop from seven-year-old, I, I see a vision of a poem, <laughs> to I'm going to start writing regularly? And well, I mean, maybe I didn't have enough friends. I was like the, you know, the loner at home in my room writing poetry a lot. Was poetry your um, first love? It was, it okay. was. And so I wrote poetry until about 19. And the great thing about poetry as a, as a form of training is that it makes you pay attention to each individual word. Mm. You can't just mm. gallop on with the story. Mm. Um, and perhaps for someone as loquacious as me, it's very good to be forced to slow down. In that is that time, ever a know? hindrance, though, as a novelist, if you're agonizing over every But I'm not anymore, oh, you see. I just see. while okay. I was writing poetry, <laughs> okay. I agonized over every word. And then I got, I, I got an idea for my first novel at 19, and I've been sort of, you know, chatting <laughs> loquaciously ever since. Yeah. Um, what I can't believe is that I've got away with this, that I've never had to, you know, knuckle down and have a sensible job. <laughs> you know, I keep thinking my luck will run out. You're very talented. People, your work resonates with people. I suppose so, but I've met other talented people and uh, just if they haven't sold enough copies of their novel in a big market like America, they can't live off well, it. Well, yes, so of course. They have to do a huge amount of I've, other work. I've had authors like that on this show. We talk about that for sure. So uh, the first idea was what at 19? What was your first idea? Um, it was, um, I saw a little... Uh, add a little handwritten notice on the accommodation notice board at my university um, and I was intrigued by it so I, I wrote 
the novel as a kind of a what if about what if you answered that ad. You what, know? what novel is this? Um, Stir Fry, it's called, okay, my okay. first one. So basically I used my own life material for, for the first two novels. You right. know, So one was about my university and one was about my high school and that was it. I had nothing left and I had no childhood trauma. You know, <laughs> So I <had laughs> drained myself dry in two books. So then I wrote a book of fairy tales and that was great as a way of sort of pulling me out of my cultural context. This was and literally then, for children. Yeah, um, well, for, uh, I wrote it for adults, but in America it was published for young adults because they said fairy tales were always for teenagers. Right, okay, okay. Um, and, and then I started writing historical fiction, and since then I've just had a sense of being able to write whatever I feel like it, you know, uh, whatever I feel like, there's, that there's no reason you have to speak of your time and place, because of course you always will, right? Even yeah. if you're writing about a previous era, you are going to bring your own material in. Yes, of course. But there's no reason to limit yourself to your time and place. What is the difference between your material and the filter of your li- lived experience? Do you know the difference? Like, I mean, obviously you're going to bring, everything we read of yours is from your perspective. Uh, you, you highlight the fact that your first two novels were really about your own lived experience. But I mean, isn't everything you uh, I mean we're talking about a kin you spend time in Nice yeah no and and also even if there's no actual autobiographical content there's of course attitudes you know if I'm writing about being a sex worker on the streets of London in the 1760s it's not what I've lived it's more what I imagine I might think or perceive or judge or feel in those moments what is that process like for you I mean I've talked to other authors about this of conjuring the character and then coming up with them do you uh, like i mean and then sort of um establishing them i suppose like are you just meditatively thinking about this character what they would do how they'd react they're always in the back of your mind you know and you'll be going about your day and you'll suddenly think oh she'll have very long toes (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, well, I think he needs a haircut. You know? <laughs> so they're just living in your mind. Yeah, it makes you a little bit absent-minded. <laughs> and you borrow things as well from, from friends. You know, it's right. not just your own material. Um, I often ask friends, like, can I have that? Right, you know? right. And they're usually very generous with it. Now, you tend to oscillate between long-form novels and short stories. Is that correct? Yes, though I have noticed I've been doing a lot of writing for film and TV in the last few years, and so almost no short stories. Hmm. So I think I always need to oscillate between the novel of the day and the side project. The so I suspect that, yeah. that screenwriting has shoved short fiction out of the way for me. What about poetry? Is that still in your practice? Never. I've written none since 19. I just mm. completely flipped over. Interesting. You know? yeah. I mean, you apply poetic aspects in your in your prose, I assume. I mean, I know this. I've read your... <laughs> I can see the poetics in... Uh, I can see the the uh, intent of a poet in some of your writing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you try and make sentences with some... Art? But the right words yeah. in them. Yeah. <laughs> Artfulness. Um, but, turns but, of phrase. But no, no actual poems anymore. And I write plays a lot too. I, I did a lot of um, you know, drama classes as a teenager, got very into theatre. Right. So um really my, my screenwriting now grows out of that as much as my fiction. You know, I've always liked writing, you know, drama and dialogue in in whatever form it comes up now i mean you are uh, some people would know you uh, almost exclusively from your book room i'm so impressed you've got this far through the interview without talking about and it people you like to talk about refreshing room. oh I endlessly <laughs> i i i, I, I want to talk about akin but I, I we have to talk about room hey, i'm not really complaining you know because as i was saying you know if you're the rolling stones you know that's all people want is the oldies well <laughs> so. uh, one of the reasons i bring was was this sc- well, one of the things i want to ask you i mean okay for those who don't know room was a, a major smash for, for you, right? Room was sold a lot in many countries, yes. And because I did a film as well, that reached the people who don't read books necessarily as well. Right. Um, so that, that book certainly reached, you know, several million people in a way that my other books have. This is an award-winning film, uh, Oscar nom- Oscar winning, right, even? Yeah, Brie Larson got the Oscar right. for Best Actress. So this yeah. is a big deal, and, I, and I'm not trying to uh, uh, make us ruminate on it, if you will. <laughs> and I'm not That's trying to... terrible! <laughs> I know. I'm a dad. I, I of young children I make dad jokes no I also <laughs> don't want to avoid it either I was that your first screenplay it was my first screenplay that got filmed right yeah yeah I, I tried a couple before but the, the film industry is so hard to get into it just felt impossible whereas because of Room because of the, sh- the, the good luck I had with that one and I worked with a wonderful director by the way so you know the screenplay I ended up writing was really written in, in response to him oh okay you know and he would like gently 
he'd, he'd say to me like that bit is too on the nose or that bit is too TV you know so he he, he encouraged me not to stick to the rules of screenwriting who directed you know? Room? Lenny Abramson okay. he's an Irish director right. and okay. just exquisite um, so um, yeah but since then I've had a huge number of offers to, to do screenwriting and you know that's like suddenly being let into a party where you thought you had no chance of getting in so that's why I've been doing so much since then so I, I just want to distinguish something here though were you writing so the other screenplays the other screenwriting you've done is not necessarily based on your own work. I'm sorry. How do no, I put indeed. this? Um, no, indeed. No. Uh, since Room, I've um, adapted two of my novels for film, but I've also been adapting other people's work, and in one That's case, what doing I was an asking. original series. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to so cite? Do you want to cite any of those? I'm um, just curious. Would we know them? No, I can't say yet because they might not get made. Oh, or, right. You know, they could get made with somebody else as the main screenwriter. I mean, nothing is I certain okay, until okay. a film or, or TV series is actually coming out so and they take so long to fund and right. they're so unpredictable right mm -hmm. and the people option your books and they don't do anything with them and it's yeah, frustrating yeah so is is room the only screenplay you've written that was turned into a film yes okay so far it's the only one so yeah I, I just all i'm curious about because i f i f when i read when i read akin i kind of had a strong vision of the characters yeah. and i had a strong uh, notion of the the landscape Tell me about doing this yourself. You have to take your, your novel and adapt it to a screenplay. What is that process actually like? I mean, you're obviously... Well, it's funny. Some writers hate to do it. Like um, um, Nick Hornby adapts other people's novels into films, but he can't bear to do it to his own. Right. It's, it's like you don't want to kill your own children. I imagine you know? it's like carving <laughs> up your own work to try to be like... It's like an edit You in should a only sense. do it if you're really enthusiastic to see how the story might be told in a different form completely different form right. like when you're writing for film you're telling a story in light and in faces and that has completely different merits to telling it through words mm. so I would mm. say a book is very good for the psychology the detailed uh, shaping of a relationship so say what I was trying to do in a kin showing this old man and this boy getting to know each other over one week I think a novel is great for that because they have time to have all the conversations and you don't have to make the conversations too on the nose you don't have to make the the changes too obvious you can right. keep it subtle and messy and you can interrupt them and have them hark back to things and echo each other um, whereas there's less dialogue in a film and so it's all pared down to the dialogue that really matters and so you that's can't, gotta be weird you that's can't gotta be quite be as <laughs> relaxed about it yeah it's yeah. gotta be weird to do that to your own creation. yeah but what you have to say to yourself is well maybe i could tell that particular scene just through the faces and the light and the and the colors right, you know right. so um there are many moments in in room the film for instance where you know they took out my dialogue because they didn't need it and what you've got is you know up on this huge screen you've got a face like that of jake tremblay and the viewer doesn't know exactly what he's thinking but his face is so mysteriously interesting and they're projecting their own feelings onto yeah, him yeah. so they're thinking I was that kid right. you know they're psycho psychologically it's very strange how we sort of invest in these beautiful faces <laughs> um, it is very strange on film and we, we bring so much of our own stuff and our own memories to them whereas in a book it's much more the author telling you what's going on exactly that's true that's true okay so you enjoy both equally. I enjoy both I wouldn't do it unless I was enthusiastic okay yeah. so is there a future for a kin in this other realm? I don't know. It, it doesn't seem a very plot-based novel to me. I mean, the plot, the very plot-driven ones are a more obvious fit for film. But you never know. It's certainly, um, it's, it's got, you know, a strong relationship at the heart of it and a very, very beautiful setting. So you never know. Okay. But I certainly never write fiction in order to write a movie. That would be a, a perversely indirect way of trying to get into the film. Business. But it's weird. I mean, you write a <laughs> screenplay and it's really meant for another form like that's an interesting thing yeah no to me you know y you need to pick the form that excites you most for that story at first so in, in in this case i would say it had to be a novel because i was interested in just the stream of thoughts going through noah's yeah. mind yeah, 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 you know yeah. and 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 letting the dialogue as i say you know just giving them enough time it's only a week but it's still a lot of conversations i had forgotten it was only a week that's true the action all takes place over the course of a week that's interesting well if you could suggest to people you know something you hope they take away from a kin in particular i mean i've talked about how it impacted me and thinking about my own relationship with my parents as they get older and and raising questions about questions i have for them about what it was really like like i and even whether or not i've even really thought about what they experienced growing up and and in and, and their young adulthood i mean do you have i know you probably don't have a message for people not a message but um i suppose most of our novels are about adults and adults in the kind of middle zone. But in this novel, I've kind of pushed it to those two extremes of age. So I like 
the fact that readers who might sort of stereotype the old or kids would find themselves, you know, in the head of a 79 year old who's still just as alive as any of us. You know, he's not suddenly conservative or, or silly just because he's 79. And again, through the boy and his conversation, you know, he seems like just some thuggish kid at first and, and you start to care about him. So so I, I suppose with my novels, I'm always seeing them as kind of machines of empathy, you know, getting right. people to care about people who are not like them. Right. And I mean, it should be noted that this is really a story of, of women, uh, women who have been in prison women the who missing mothers yeah yeah yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah it's, it's two guys but they're very preoccupied with their mothers and their wives i mean noah yes noah's dead wife talks in his head yes yeah. well <laughs> so you know i had to include a jew right i couldn't write a book <laughs> that touched on the holocaust and have it all be about french catholics <laughs> right. so I, noah's jewish wife gets to do her kind of provocative conversation thing that the whole like tradition of say arguing with God yes. I like the idea that she still argues with Noah you're very crafty Emma that's a very <laughs> crafty move I thought it was an interesting move okay so what I would traditionally ask at the end of this thank you for this conversation about you and your work and akin but do you have a next plan do you have something on, in, on the go uh, you mentioned earlier like I jettisoned this book so I can think about the next one are you on, on to the next oh, one? Oh, I'm, I'm in rewrites on the next novel actually oh, already? Oh. I'm horribly fast I'm afraid it makes me look shallow because the writers who produce a book every 10 years they just seem so deep and impressive and everybody assumes that they've spent 10 years thinking about <laughs> it when they might have spent 9 of those years <laughs> drinking and partying right. you know but I just seem to work fast and I don't think making myself go more slowly would make the books any better so okay. yes I'm, I'm into the next novel which I can't talk about yet because it's not sold I right, right. don't want to jinx it by talking about it and then having but my you, publishers hate it. You're <laughs> in rewrites, so you're feeling good about it. Uh, how does rewrites? Yes, like, uh, yes. Rewrites is interesting. Like, we we kind of talked about the adaptation. I suppose I always do about three drafts. So I do a, really, do. I do a rough draft that I only show my agent and my partner. But is it the whole thing? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. huh. I don't want them to start messing with it until it's finished. Right. You know? So I never tell them about it beforehand. I don't like... I don't like. I once sold a novel on the basis of a summary. So my publisher thought they knew what they were getting. And I felt horribly self-conscious that you know they were sort of watching over my shoulder. Right. So I much prefer to write the book. And it, it, it's entirely mine. And I am the queen of my lonely domain <laughs> and then I sell it um, but there is always a moment when I send it off and I think will anybody but me care about this <laughs> right <laughs> right right are you an outline person or are you just I'm going to start and go no I'm a huge planner because I don't have those natural plotting skills oh, that okay. some writers have so I'm, I'm like some kind of civil servant of the imagination <laughs> you know I have little note files for everything what does it look like are you like solving a mystery do you have uh, you know uh, post-it notes all over your wall of Plot uh, development? No, I'm much. Uh, it, it, that's very old tech. Um, the post-it <laughs> notes. I use Scrivener, so it's the equivalent of post-it notes. Right. You know, I'd have a little file for each scene, and within that, I might have a file saying, "Here are some photographs that I'm thinking of for this one," and then I might have a file talking about the food they're eating, and right. I might have a file of notes saying, "How long is the flight from from New York to Paris?" Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. So yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. sort of. It, yeah, it's, oh, a, it's like a complicated the research planning notes. structure. Okay. So yeah. you're, you're you're something else. I can tell. <laughs> you got a lot going on there, and you're keeping track of it. It's good. It's but very also, good. Also, a book is big and messy. You you would f you would lose control of it if you didn't. Uh, absolutely. Keep notes on it. Somehow. I just I had a conversation with a writer on the show once, and he we were talking about his very intricate new novel. And he said, "Yeah, I just start and I go, and wow. it's, it's sort of done." And I mean, I'm sure there's an. He said, "You know," and then I refine it and edit it. But I. He had no idea where he was going to go with it when he started, is what he said. And I found yeah. that interesting. Yeah, the planners and the wingers. We are a very varied <laughs> bunch. There's clearly no... <laughs> exactly. There's no you know, process you can learn for how to write a novel. Right. Because it's, it's, a, it's an eccentric business. Right. I mentioned uh, Next Steps. You are doing some readings. You're going to festivals and things yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm doing <laughs> most of the festivals in Canada. Yeah. Right. I know um, about the Ed Mills the Writers Festival. and Yes, on the, um, the 8th, I believe. Yes, yeah, yes. that's always a blissful one with those kind of you know you've been a few times yeah and the way so many of the locations are interesting like little churches or yeah. you'll be on a grassy hill you know I remember doing a reading a few years ago with my son in the audience reading Harry Potter as I read <laughs> oh no <laughs> he didn't look up <laughs> oh man that's the, the power inspiration of J.K. Rowling <laughs> the inspiration uh, for Michael perhaps is indeed, your son indeed <laughs> indeed yes <laughs> okay so if people want to learn more about you on the internet where would you send my them? website emma are you on all the other material. things are you, on um, all you know I, I i realize i'm a bit old-fashioned here in that i'm not on instagram yet i noticed in the last few years a lot of writers have slid over from twitter and facebook to instagram right i think i'm just i don't feel i have enough images to share i feel a bit self-conscious about you know nobody wants to see a picture of my lunch um, but you I think uh, I should probably move on to Instagram because that seems to be where people are going. Emma, we just talked about a novel that is 
principally about photography. But I wouldn't be allowed to reproduce those photographs. Oh, that's on true. Would that's I? true. That's <laughs> true. That's absolutely true. Well, that's interesting. I, I think you you're secretly a photographer. <laughs> that's come out in this book. I thank you. Uh, so Emma Donahue dot, dot com is that right? Yeah. Okay. Emma, thank you so much for making time for me on this park bench in this lovely part of London, Ontario, that I don't believe I've ever been I to. I should have all my interviews here. It's delightful. Uh, it's, it's very nice. Thank you so much, and all of the best of luck. It's been a pleasure, Bish. Thank forward. you so much. Tremendous thanks to Emma Donahue for being on this, the 495th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and available on all iOS and Android platforms and Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, all sorts of things. It's everywhere you access podcasts, you can find Creative Control. But if you're looking for a particular episode and maybe it's older and it's not in any of their those feeds, you know... If you can't find one of those episodes, or if you're wanting to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter, at vishcreative, or follow me, at vishkana. You can listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time around the world at cfru.ca, or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control with K's, creative with a K, control with a K, patreon.com slash creative control. And please make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. It is a modest Patreon that we have. Uh, It would be nice if we could get it up to a level that sustains at least this being a part-time job, but it's not even close to that yet. So if you would like to make a flexible monthly donation again please go to patreon.com slash creative control only if you like the show don't just do it because i sound very pitiful right now if you enjoy the program i'd like to see it keep going and all that sort of thing again patreon.com slash creative control thanks to pizza trocadero the bookshelf and planet bean coffee in guelph and granddad's donuts in hamilton for their in-kind support for the show thanks as always to my pal jim guthrie for letting me use music of his on this program you can learn more about jim and his music at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you very much for listening to this episode and subscribing to this podcast and spreading the word about it. I will talk to you very, very soon. Goodbye for now.